Hello, my friend. Hey, man, what's up? Not much. Sorry for the delay. I just okay. uh, I just got off my Trek bicycle. Did you now? I did. Did you hit the lab? I was in the lab. Yes, oh, indeed. Oh, man. A little jealous. Well, you shouldn't be. A little, but not much. A lot of Frisbees and... Uh, oh, what? Dogs running around with no leashes and <sighs> remote cars and kids. Yeah, there... Yeah, there was remote cars the last time I was there, and it, and I, I'm waiting for it to become like a, um, you know, what is it, the Cornelia Marie or something, like the Cornelia Fort Marie or something airport, and yeah. I'm just waiting for it to turn into like a drone field. Oh, I know, and uh, uh, I'm going to do whatever I can to stop that. Yeah, I, when I get back, that's my that's one of my most important priorities, is uh, starting a petition to ban... Um, all uh, roller, well, not roller blades. No, no, no. You, yeah, easy now. Remote, <laughs> yeah. remote control yeah. vehicles. Remote, remote control. Anything uh, created um, for the use of remote control, and that could become a nuisance. Yeah, man, it's a. Uh, it can get a little hairy when you're riding around there. You know, the airport is a big oval that we ride on, people, and uh, sometimes <laughs> these guys will get out there with these remote control cars, and they'll just sort of fly out of nowhere into the middle of the road and I don't know cars are always dangerous including remote control cars evidently exactly exactly Whew. well yeah that got me man it's alright you know you gotta do your thing and and uh you know you got to practice patience while you're on your bike that yeah but I'm just saying the workout in, in, in general uh, oh yeah I am definitely on pace for a PW <laughs> Are you going to do a personal worst? Yeah. I think I can I can almost guarantee it. Oh man. Well, hey, you never know. <laughs> oh so man, I time. got I got chicked by a, a PC bro on a bike rental park rental bike. Ooh, that's always rough. I know the chain wallet didn't even matter. Oh, but hey, uh <laughs> I've got a, I've got a um I did an aerodynamic experiment. Do you do you want to hear, oh, you want to hear about I'd, it? I'd love to hear about it. Oh, people, this isn't this is good. So, whenever my uh, you know kind of inspiration is a little bit down and it's getting sort of close to the race, that's when I always turn to the razor to uh, shave my leg because I kind of let that go over the winter. And I was thinking about man, I need to shave my leg, so I use one of those to get it going. You know, one of those beard trimmers and kind of take the forest down a little bit. But I got done with uh, my right leg and the battery died, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I uh, I was like, well, I'll just plug this in and go ride. And, and uh, <laughs> so I went out. Besides the, uh, the a lot of looks that I got from people, um, yeah, it definitely mattered. I was my left. I was pull. The bike was pulling to the left. You believe that? <laughs> I don't at all. <laughs> Not at all. But. <laughs> I mean, I can honestly say, though, that yeah, while that is not true, it wasn't pulling to the left. But I could feel the hair flying around on my left leg versus the right. So there's definitely something going on there. It's legit. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying how much. Yeah. But, but there's definitely I'm, I'm, resistance. I'm going to say it's I'm, I'm gonna say it's placebo. Oh, man. What? The hair shaved in your legs? Yeah, for you. Uh, at least on one side, being a, you know, being able to tell the difference. I mean, they have specialized did do a like a wind tunnel test uh, a couple years ago with ja, maybe I think Jesse Thomas, I believe, uh, or maybe it was somebody else. But and I think they claimed something like you know three or four watts saved, but that's not like that's like barely even enough to notice. I thought they said something about six minutes over the course of an Ironman ride. Does that sound right, or is that too much? Uh, I thought that's what that's, they said. It might be around there. But here's the thing: I wasn't like saying it helped me per se. But mm-hmm. I could, I'm just saying I noticed that on my hairy leg, I could feel the wind getting caught up in my hair a little bit. Uh, so, things were getting things were getting a little hairy on that side. <laughs> well, no, it just. <laughs> I mean, you know, just normal guy hair, you know. Uh, and no, I guess man. I don't. I always wonder why that shaving my legs actually inspires me to get going. I think it's probably because I have to feel like I have to act tougher and suck it up a little bit because I'm going to have yeah. shaved legs. Yeah, anyway. it's pretty funny yeah, that we do that. But I did it growing up swimming year-round because 
and, and I don't know how much you gain in the pool, but it, it definitely makes you of all the sports. I think for me, it's in the water where I feel, you know, the, the fastest, the, my, I feel the most slippery in the water. Even with a wetsuit? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's for sure easier to get on. Yeah, that's just true. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt. I think it's uh, the biggest advantage of it all is it makes you feel faster. We've talked about that before. You just yeah. you look down, your legs are just clean. and and. Uh, but I did get chick for real out there by a girl on a sweet specialized bike. And she was wearing one of those, uh, what, those uh, Betty Page kits or whatever they are. Uh, Betty Design Kit, yeah. Yeah, Betty. Betty. I wish it was Betty Page. We need more goth, or, goth or, women in Toronto. Yeah, it would be really cool if it was American, like Betty Ford. Betty Ford? Yeah. Rehab like, clinic out in California. Yeah. Isn't it in Minneapolis as well? Uh, I think they have one in Minneapolis, Or is that yeah. Hazelden? I, well, anyway. Uh, what, do you want to talk about? Oh, I got a new wetsuit, man. Did you? Yeah. That you're, you are showing... <laughs> You're showing all of the signs of the undertrained triathlete <laughs> going into the first race. If you're if you're out there listening and uh, and you are, and I'm, I'm going to pick on the, I'm going to pick on Jim Schwann for a minute because he does this sometimes too. If you find yourself purchasing a lot of new equipment the month or two before a race, it usually means. It's time to buy some free speed. I have not trained <laughs> like I uh, have needed to, so I'm going to go purchase some stuff in hopes that it makes me motivated enough to use it and that the race I'm going to do isn't going to suck near as bad as I think it will. Oh, man, I know. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. Because I actually got in that sweatsuit, or sweatsuit, the wetsuit box came along with the new swim cap as well. And, uh, a, uh, some uh, anti-fogger the goggles yeah what kind of wetsuit did you get oh same kind xterra same, oh you did same yeah. exact kind because i knew the size and it fit and i just didn't feel like yeah. screwing around with that but it looks a little smaller so i gotta try that baby on yeah for sure hope they have, they have, they have a good like return policy yeah and it, well it's swim outlet so i'm sure they'll be perfect with it but um yeah it's kind of one of those deals you know because i feel like it might be a little bit bigger than <laughs> race weight and uh Probably. It's, it's kind of like, uh, do you buy the shoe even though it doesn't fit, hoping it's going to stretch out or you're going to lose weight or the pant? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to be in that <laughs> that dilemma mode Man, right now. You are chasing butterflies. Well, good, that's good news for CC, who I'm uh, racing, who I've heard through the grapevine actually has uh, been training harder than any any race since he dusted you and Waski at Louisville. He he didn't. What do you mean, dust? He didn't dust me. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> what do you mean he didn't? Didn't he? Uh, no, he didn't dust me. Well, you didn't check your facts. Oh. Those are alternative facts. Uh, but I can I can say he put in a, a uh, just just cycling alone. He put in seven hours this week. Jeez. I mean, you weren't the source, by the way. I just want to get that clear. Oh, I, I, just so I, he, he I, doesn't think that you're selling out. No, on. no, I, I keep I keep all my athletes pretty their stuff close to the vest. What they do with their own information is up to them. All right, well, I'll send you my real work on info in the in a few minutes. Okay, that sounds good. All right, so should we get on to the podcast? Yeah, I think I think we should. Uh, speaking of wetsuits. Yeah, speaking of wetsuits, uh, today we're going to talk everyone's favorite open water swimming. Yes. Uh, definitely one of my favorite topics. Uh, and we have discussed this a little bit um, in, <clears throat> in our episodes of How to Not Suck at Swimming, Part 1 and 2. Uh, so if you're just now uh, starting to listen to our podcast, I would definitely recommend going back and listening to those uh, in order. And uh, But today, instead of talking about uh, common mistakes people make in the pool and how they you know, in, in training methods and stuff like that, I, f- I figured I would just talk generally, and we, I'll include some of those and, and why they matter, but why open water swimming is so different, uh, why it scares people, what you can do to help kind of mitigate that stress and anxiety, and uh, hopefully, you know, set yourself up for, uh, you know, a, a better race. You know, I, I even have athletes that... Um, you know, are you know still have somewhat 
you know, anxiety about getting in the open water. And, you know, it's, it all, it's definitely the scariest for some people, which I, which I find, I find it fascinating. And I know that I kind of have a, a, um, my experience and, and, in open water and having um, swam year round growing up, but that wasn't a pool. So that doesn't always translate. And, but I've just, I've always had a love of the water. Um, just growing up, like going to the ocean with my family and I could just like, I, they would lose me for like out, not lose me, but I'd just go out and like swim for hours in the ocean with like no care in the world. No, like it, swimming far out just never phased me. It's always something I really enjoyed and then i worked for an ocean rescue squad as well so it's always kind of been there and i just find it fascinating how scared and anxious people get yet when they get on their bicycle to ride and do training rides with cars around or going down hills they just have like no fear (laughs) yeah and 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 for me that's like imminent death it's it's like uh it's like flying in an airplane versus driving in a car you know it's um and you know one steers well, one scares people like to death, but it's it was actually safer, and the other one. Uh, oh, I see. You're more, more likely to get in a, to get in a crash or injury. But why are um, they scared of? Uh, are you going to get into that? Well, I mean, I, there's always different factors, you know. And, and I and and I would start with the one is just lack of experience um, in open water, and, and it never really comes from. Uh, it's always about. It's always just a a lack of experience before they really even get into triathlon, um, of just being in open water, whether it's lakes, oceans, whatever. Um, so you combine that with, you know, not the greatest swimming ability, and you kind of have the the perfect recipe for, um, you know, super high anxiety, and then you add a little another little cherry on top of a really really tight wetsuit that people don't train enough in and you're just like, you, you feel like your chest is going to cave in with anxiety. Yeah. And I think that's, and I think that's what, and plus you add the nerves of the race and, and there's just, there's so many things that, um, that so many factors that, you know, play into it. And I think not being able know, to see that, I think that's a big one for people n- for whatever reason, n- they, they don't know yeah, what's some- down there kind of thing. Yeah, um, yeah, I think that is too, and that's—I well, mean, that's not a fear that. Yeah, I mean, true. If you're in a lake, I mean, but come on, people, you're in a well, lake. Well, I mean, that's yeah. what I mean. Like some people are are actually more—they like the ocean better for whatever reason because it's cleaner or something. And they can see sometimes. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but lakes. Well, I mean, I, I can I can tell you from being in the ocean, you most of the time you don't want to see. That's what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> that's why I like yeah, I mean, lakes. You, you don't you don't want to see like so when I did ocean rescue stuff in Hilton Head. Um, the water there is really, really, really murky. I um, mean, it, it's always terrible visibility. Oh, okay. And we would always communicate with the coast guards, and they would always tell us, like, just be glad you can't see. Yeah. Um, because they, they would they would send us uh, shots of the overhead when they would do flybys of like sharks, just pr- not everywhere, but pretty close to in and around the swimmers. But you just have no idea they're there because it's so it's so murky. Um, and I'm sure that that really cured somebody's anxiety living in Hilton Head going his first <laughs> swim today. Um, yeah, so back, back to back to it's really getting over your fear. Getting over your fear of the open water is more about um, doing it more often and just being in the water and being in your wetsuit more and just taking all of the factors that contribute to your anxiety. But you really can't do that until you figure out why you're even ang- anxious in the first place. Yeah. And I don't think a lot of people actually take enough time to sit back and actually think about, all right, why am I actually that, like, why am I actually freaking out? Like, you can't, it's this, it's literally probably the safest place you can possibly be when it comes to the terms of the race. Okay. There are, you, you're, you're wearing a wetsuit, you're basically, you could literally fl- turn over and flow on your back and be just fine. Mm-hmm. Like, like without without problem, um, you can. There's a million different kayakers and lifeguards and people, and you can't tell me if somebody saw you drowning, they wouldn't stop and help. Um, and you probably wouldn't. You probably swim over them, but <laughs> Wait, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> but uh, but no, I, I think a lot of it is is uh, the wetsuit factor, how it closed in. It's a feeling of the unknown. 
you know, it, it, I think it'd be the same thing as if I told you to, you had never ridden a bike outside before, and then I told you to go ride a course like Wisconsin yeah. or Lake Placid. That's super technical, lots of downhills. They would be an anxious wreck because you just don't have the the experience. And open water is much more of a um, experience type sport that you need to kind of just, I mean, no pun intended, dive right into versus, oh, I can just swim um, super easy all the time, which also really, really, really contributes to people's lack of uh, confidence when it comes to open water because more often than not most triathletes have one speed and it's usually pretty easy and pretty chill in the pool so they never really know what it feels like to get anaerobic and and uh and almost hypoxic in the water and even if they do they can stand um right that was what i was going to say is that one of the things that uh and it's happened to me it happened to me early for sure is you know the, the first few times you go out and look at that triathlon course on an open water it looks so damn far, you know, compared to like staring at the other side of the pool and or knowing you can stand up. But I mean, when you look out there and it's like a, you know, full Ironman course or even a half, it looks kind of intimidating, you know, to think about it. So that probably sets off anxiety waves inside too, because it's just that unknown. It just looks like further than you would imagine, I think. At least for me, it did. Yeah. I mean, I, well, to be honest with you, I think this is probably one of those podcasts where you should probably do some of the leading since uh since you kind of overcame your fear and you know what were some of the the things you were most anxious about and what kind of helped you um yeah. almost look forward to the swim versus you know um be fearful of it which a lot of people are yeah the well i can tell you that the uh the f- first couple times it was pretty bad for me um because that was one of the reasons is because you look out well one of the the first one, the course looked so long. It was a river swim. The second one was the one in Knoxville, and it was 56-degree water or something like that. It was a cold, rainy morning. And I, you know how you, in the morning, I'm just for sure a slow warmer-upper anyway. And when you're cold, your anxiety, I think, is even higher because you're, just, you know, you're not warmed up and you're not calm. So um, I think over time, I realized it. And, and I know that there was a point when we had talked about, and you, I think you wrote about this, about not putting your wetsuit on too early. Um, because it gets you too hot and, you know, can, mm-hmm. can, can go in reverse. But at a certain point, um, and I can't remember what race it was, I started putting it on a little earlier than I normally would just because of how it felt. And like you said, I hadn't been wearing it a lot. So it was more like I wanted to just get used to, you know, deep breathing and I would warm up my body and be in my wetsuit and get used to the feeling of that pressure on my chest. So by the time I got into the water, I was, I was kind of warmed up. And, you know, I may be different because I'm not a morning person at all. So it's about throwing myself into the fire, kind of. I have to get to a point mentally where um, that cold water, that early morning, that, that shock value thing, you know. I mean, I got used to it that one summer because we went out to the lake all the time. But um, if you're not hitting open water a lot during training, it can be a different feeling, you know, early in the morning, jumping in a cool, cold lake or something like that. So for me, a huge part of it was getting warmed up and kind of getting a little bit of a sweat going because um, I'm just a more relaxed person. And I think everybody is when the blood's pumping a little bit. Yeah, I mean, and one thing, if you're out there and you're, you're anticipate doing any kind of uh, cold water uh, swimming is... Um, you know that's that not to where you like need like a neoprene cap and booties, but you know a, col- a colder swim. You know one of the reasons that it's hard to it's it's hard to catch your breath when you start because the water is so cold. You know, and and it's hard to even put your face in sometimes for people. And and a good thing to do is that when you're anticipate when you know that's going to happen is to take a take a cup of like ice cold water and walk it down to the start line with you and just and just gradually pour it down the back of your neck oh yeah um and and what that does is you know a lot of people will do that when they're getting ready for a hot swim because it keeps your body temperature cool but what it does for you um before a cold swim is it actually just kind of go it's it shocks your body beforehand and kind of prepares it and once you kind of get out of that initial like kind of shock um it's definitely easier once you get into the water uh, to be able to deal with the, the, that uh, change in low temperature. 
Yeah. I remember you telling me that even if you don't have a cup of water or something, it's just good to lean in and kind of just grab the water, water out of the lake yeah. or river. Yeah, absolutely. And do the yeah. same thing and dro- drop it down your back because that will certainly kind of get your body ready for what's coming next because that can be a, a shocker. I was thinking too, you know, at – I was, uh, you know, I'm so uh, generally competitive that, you you know, you get fired up and you want to get in there and you want to start kind of maybe towards the front or whatever. And that I, I just started trying to find spots that uh, looked open and maybe a little bit off to the side because my game plan after the first couple that I um, freaked out in the water while swimming, I had to stop and tread water for a while both times is that I just, my game plan was just to go twice as slow as I thought I could you know I mean like re- mm-hmm. really back it down out of the gate because you're usually going faster than you think right oh I'll, every time every time you're going out so I tried to go like the slowest as I could go for the first you know three or four hundred yards or something and like I said settle in and, and usually there's a point about that time about 500 or so when I start to feel like all right now I feel loose and relaxed and and then and then the whole thing becomes more enjoyable what were what were some of the things we did uh open when we did our open water swim clinics that you feel like best set you up for success uh when you did race and kind of helped transform you into someone who dreaded the open water to someone who actually you know kind of welcomed it well for sure what we the things a lot of stuff we were doing was way harder than uh, you would experience in the race. It's that train hard, harder than you're going to race kind of thing where mm-hmm. we would, um, you know, you, d- you set up a lot of drills where there's going to be forced uh, congestion and stuff like that when we would do a lot of about, I, I always felt like it was a 150, 175 out and around that buoy. It was kind of always a sprint. And uh, we would always swim that hard out to a buoy about 75 yards and then come back in hard. And there would always be a lot of people congesting around that buoy and there'd be a lot of contact. So that was one thing. The other thing you, you had us do is get out of the, do that, get out of the water, run down the beach, corner like another cone or I guess it was a life jacket and then run back in and do the same thing and come in and mm-hmm. out and run up. And that was just so hard to keep getting out of the water and going back into the water and running that, you know, that kind of stuff just makes regular swimming seem a lot easier you know when you don't have to deal with the the you know because you're running and your heart's just you know you're going so you yeah, have to kind of control your heart rate oh yeah i mean for sure anytime i mean and that's one of the most painful things when you no matter how hard of a kicker you are when you when you race when you get out of the water those first 10 20 steps are just painful mm-hmm. uh, because you there's no matter how hard you kick you don't have near enough blood and so what that is is that blood are kind of rushing down from your arms and your chest so doing that, you know, over and over and again, over and over again, uh, you know, booing backs, obviously, um, and then running down the beach and cornering and doing another one, you know, in one 10 minute workout, you're working on, you know, open water entry and exit, you know, siding and swimming hard, um, in transition, you know, in one 10 minute, you know, span, I think you said something that, that I hope people really take to heart and, and swimming is one that people do the opposite, is they just they don't train harder than the, than they're going to race. You do in every other sport. Mm-hmm. You you do hard efforts on the bike. You do hard efforts on the run. People just rarely do it in the pool because they because it's in my opinion it's the most uncomfortable by far. Our hard hard efforts in the pool are are on a different scale in my opinion than cycling and and running because it is total body and it is lack of oxygen. Um, it's just a different kind of burn. But so let me ask you this. Do you feel like if you had to pick, do you feel like the benefits you got that kind of put you over the edge? Was it the mental psychological training that we did out there or the physical fitness uh, approach training we did out there that you think made the biggest difference? Mm. Well, yeah, that's always one of those things. I think it kind of, again, goes hand in hand because if you know that you can – do some of those tough physical workouts that you mentally get stronger. Um, but I think, I think I don't know, I think it's pretty even because there's certainly, we, you know, we took sort of an approach or you took sort of an approach to set us up to experience, you know, kind of the worst of what we would experience out there, meaning a lot of contact, a lot of, uh, 
you know, swimming to get out of trouble or out of, you know, trying to, because you got to go hard to get out of some of those uh, melees sometimes. So we did a lot of that. And um, that just, it, it got me so used to it. And mentally, I remember that we did that all summer and I went to Wisconsin and I was looking at 2,700 people around me floating. And I was not in one way intimidated by contact at that point. So that's a huge mental advantage. If that doesn't bother you, it was almost kind of, uh, enjoyable in a kind of twisted <laughs> way, you know. Like if somebody bump into you before, I mean, like when I first started, you somebody, you welcomed it because it was normal. Yeah, and it was. I was very adept at, and I think that's helped me even to this day. I'm very pretty adept at, like when someone does clock me from one side, uh, I just kind of flow. You know, I just go with it. You know, it's almost like uh, taking a charge in basketball or something. If you if you try to stand there and hold your ground, it's going to hurt a lot more. You know, or and it's a lot easier just to keep momentum if you go with the, in, or it's actually like, you know, uh, martial arts. They always tell you to go, you know, to, don't try and hold your face in there and move it away as you're getting hit or move your body. And, and so that's the kind of mental and psychological leverage that it definitely helped with. So we, we would do for, I don't know, most of our listeners didn't take part in the clinic that I, that I did, but we would do things like <clears throat> we had we had a and I think a lot of people have access to places like this. And there's there's a couple places here in Kansas City that have like a you know a sand like a beach like area on a lake, and we would do like we would line you know some days it'd be ten fifteen twenty people long, and we would line everybody up shoulder to shoulder, and you know so you're taking up a line that's about you know fifteen yards long, and you're swimming all towards the same buoy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you if you haven't watched any like ITU racing or anything like that, when it's just a mad dash to get to the buoy first, like getting to the buoy first and having your position is what it's all about. You know, you don't have to you you won't get caught. You know, um, on the left or the right, inside or outside of the buoy, you can kind of pick your own line. So what it teaches you is that is to be comfortable with going for your line and siding. When you're having lots of action going on going on around you, there is a lot of contact. You're a lot of times you guys will be swimming into the sun, um, and you're you're shooting for this buoy that's not even close to the size of those huge like yellow orange rectangular buoys yeah. of uh, they'd have out in these races. And and then we so we do things like that. We would do things where I would line up, you know, the ten slowest people uh, first, and then the ten fastest people behind them, and I'd send off the slowest people first. Um, giving them about like a you know ten or fifteen second lead, and then let the fast people follow. And it, you know, as uncomfortable as it is, it, it taught the slower swimmers to um, be comfortable with people swimming over them, swimming up against them, um, and then being comfortable holding their own holding their own pace and holding their own position and their own form and and being okay with it. And it taught the faster swimmers to be okay. You know, going over or around or, or you know making decisions like, do I need to go left? Do I need to go right? And and so what it did is it it just makes everybody more comfortable. Yeah, I mean, we would do. I would you know implement crazy things like I'd bring out the uh, tennis ball and launch it you know 50 meters out, and as soon as and have everybody um, nobody could sprint in the water until it hit the hit the water. And everybody was on a mad dash to get to it first. You know, there's, there's so, and then and you said something that I'll touch on quickly, but, you know, there were times I'd have you guys like um, put your goggles around your neck mm-hmm. and you had to swim into the water and take like 10 strokes before you could even put them back on. You know, and, and, and yes, is it crazy? Does it sound like, is this guy trying to train you for like, you know, U.S. Coast Guard, Navy SEAL stuff, or is he trying to train you to like swim 2.4 miles? Well, what I'm trying to do is prepare you for any possible worst case scenario you can imagine. And I can tell you right now that if most triathletes don't spend time changing a tire or learning how to change a, uh, change a flat on their bike, they sure as hell aren't going to prepare for the worst case scenario in the water right. and that is and that is and that is why more people are anxious is because they haven't done it they haven't prepared they haven't lived through it and the biggest thing is they haven't just figured out that huh, i can handle it 
<laughs> you know, like yeah. you know, I can like I can the experience and the emotional mental part of it is what they need to get over and f- just kind of figure out, okay, I can do it. And if you need to cry it out, cry it out. Because I'll be the first one to tell you, I've had many people leave, you know, leave sessions I've done open water eyes in tears. You know, leave er- leave early. But did they come back the next day? Yep. They always came back. And they're like, you know what? I, I needed that to kind of get over it and feel like it was, knew it was going to be okay and then come back the next day. And better to do it in practice um you know around people and when it didn't really doesn't doesn't really count then do it in a race and feel like you have to pull out of the water cuz if you dnf in the swim um for an ironman it is 100% your fault you can't blame you can't blame anybody else you can't blame uh the current you can't blame whatever it is 100% your fault yeah and there is no nutrition. There is no nutrition to bail it on. There is no mechanical. There is no broken bone on a stress fracture on a run or a cramp. It is 100% your fault. And so prepare for prepare prepare yourself to be able to complete it comfortably and confidently. Um, and if you can't do that, then I would encourage you to not even attempt to do one. I agree. The you said when you were talking about that you send the slower run or swimmers off fast and then the faster ones behind them. It occurred to me that that's really kind of an interesting exercise too for like wave starts because I think, you know, when slower swimmers and me included on a lot of times because you're always going to have the fast ones from the group behind you catching. And when that starts to happen, it's a weird feeling. So it helped get us used to having people kind of coming up behind you. And also if, uh, you know, you start behind somebody and there's a big log jam, it gives you practice, kind of like you're saying, negotiating, um, getting around people in front of you. Because a lot of, um, you know, wave starts will create different sorts of challenges and pockets of congestion because yeah, of I that mean, reason. Yeah, I mean, you know, in open water swimming, rubbing is racing. Yeah. Um, you're going to have contact. And if you can't handle it and you're not prepared for it, then you're going to stop and you're going to tread water and you're going to, you know, it's just, it's not, it's, uh, it's not going to go well for you. And the other biggest thing that you can do and, and you, you can attest to this cause you participated in it is if you swim, like not slow, it's when you swim slow, like with that kind of intent, like slow strokes, when you're in a group of people, you're going to get absolutely murdered. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, if you're taking two strokes to the other person's four, I mean, you're, you're going to you're going to get absolutely obliterated. Um, and then that's why you know in the previous uh, podcasts about how to not suck at swimming one and two, I talk so much about high turnover. Um, is that that is the biggest differentiator between good open water swimmers and not? Is that people in the a lot of times in the pool, people are obsessed with distance per stroke, and they confuse that with um, taking the most time to take that stroke and to get that distance and then swimming again. Open water, that, that doesn't matter. That doesn't fly. It's how far you can get with each stroke that matters. Um, so stroke rate and stuff, uh, stroke rate's important, but it's not like, you know, don't, don't tell me you have a, uh, your swallow score, your distance per stroke or how many strokes it took you to get to the other pool. I just want to know how, how fast you did it. And, you know, you, you can take a protected body of water with a lane and black lines and a lifeguard and that's four feet deep with your distance per stroke and doing it long and doing it easy and padding and padding the water. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw you into uh, the lake in Wisconsin or a lake or an, or an ocean uh, swim with a current, um, with waves, with nobody around where you can't see anything. And you tell me how good that's going to apply. Because it's not, and you know that's why we do things like a lot of band work and high turnover work is because you know people when you're used to like swimming in a bubble, which is what which is what a lot of people train how a lot of people train in the pool, it's these slow monotonous strokes, and let's see now what I would do was when you hop into an Iron Man and that gun goes off, I just popped your bubble. Yeah. And, and and now you are no longer protected, and now it's a free for all, and you're you are going to be on the bottom of the food chain, 
and that's how you need to approach your pool sessions um, in, in turn of how, you know, and not, uh, you know, just taking it for granted that you're going to be able to swim the same because you see you hear it all the time. Oh, I, I'm swimming. I'm just crushing in the pool. I'm, I'm clicking off like 130s and and this and this and this. And then they you plop them into the open water and they end up doing like 150s and they can't figure out what's wrong. Um, and uh, and I can tell you, a lot of things are probably wrong. Yeah, and one is that you're like the other part of that. Uh, don't suck at swimming was be strong, and be yeah. st- strong is like you're saying is is uh, high turnover. And it's it's uh, if you're doing long, slow gliding strokes, that just doesn't give you good bait. I mean, that doesn't give you good base. I mean, you're gonna get bounced around, and you're gonna lose your rhythm. But if you're kind of if you're um, going after a little bit more and getting that high turnover, that's just gonna give you better balance in contact. Oh yeah, because you're, you're, you're also keeping your shoulders square. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's a, you're 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 creating your own lane. And so with a high turnover and keeping your arms wide, you make it even more difficult for people to kind of interfere with, you know, your zone, you know, your, the space you've kind of created, um, because you shouldn't be sharing it and you should feel free to kind of, like I said, swap pain with the person next to you. Um, if you want to, I'm sure there's video of this somewhere. If you want to find like a really good, um, video of the perils of individuals, who have the long, slow strokes that do like total immersion crap or something else, take a video or find one of like the Music City Triathlon in Nashville and watch these people try to swim against the current um, by taking like three strokes and probably ending up a foot behind where they originally started. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and then watch the people who actually swim through it by um, – by doing a faster a faster turnover yeah i mean and, and I think, a stronger turnover and that holds uh you know that was an extraordinary current um that day specifically because i raced it but that just holds true against the current in, in any way right i mean oh yeah anything you know. i mean it's 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 always you have to have a higher you have to have a high turnover and I mean, like I've done, I said before already, but go watch any, go back and watch the Olympics rerun, go back and watch any ITU racing, go back and watch any, um, you know, the Kona coverage, whatever, and look at these guys' turnovers. And in the distance per stroke, it doesn't mean slow. It's how far you can propel yourself forward with each stroke that matters. And if you can do, and if if you can propel yourself, you know, two feet in the water. Well, if you can just get a faster turnover by doing it, that's how you that's how you get from one place to another quicker, not by gliding and doing all that garbage that that people think makes them look pretty in the pool. Um, and that's fine if that's if that's kind of your prerogative, but don't expect to have a real breakthrough in the open water uh, until you've you've kind of committed yourself to giving up what might or may not make me faster in the pool, but what's ultimately going to make me a lot faster in the open water. And a lot of people just aren't willing to do that. Cause again, it's, it's about, um, cause I mean, there, there are a lot of times where somebody I know will just dust me in the pool or they kick a ton and they're, they got, you know, great flip turns and they're whatever. And there's, you know, they're super efficient for the pool. And then we get the open water and I can dust them by, a couple minutes and cause it, cause they, they just, they don't translate like you would think they would. And you just have to be okay. Um, knowing you're doing ultimately what's going to benefit you in the long run versus, you know, your slow, smooth and, uh, you know, crisp, uh, swim session, uh, at the local YMCA. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I have one more thought on, uh, the anxiety portion of this the chest you know tightness and the whole nine yards um now i when i used to when i started i always would see you know people running a little bit before the swim and i always thought they were crazy and um not that i would i don't know i haven't been able to get myself to really do that but there's been a couple times when i've been late and i had to like jogged (laughs) (laughs) to the swim start and uh specifically that music city race i actually rode my bike that morning because it was about it's about uh, 
probably about five or six miles maybe to the race site. So I just rode my bike um, that morning. And thank I, I feel like that that helped me have a really good swim, even though it was a tremendously difficult swim against the current for probably almost a thousand yards, a ma- major current. But I think it helped um, it loosen me up. I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to, I don't know what, what the right you know prescription is for how to kind of loosen up but my thought on that is does it make any sense that if you do like a little run or a little bike before uh you swim that you're you'll have a little bit more blood in your legs and maybe it'll take some of that chest pain or pressure of everything flowing to your heart or i don't know does it does that is there any theory there and i think people just people do it just to wake themselves up i mean and wait, wait wake their body up um and just get everything firing um, I, don't, I don't know how it translates to your performance or lack of anxiety in the water, um, but uh, you know I'm sure it does more more good than it does anything else. Yeah, that makes sense. You got anything else you want to say to close this baby up? Uh, no, I don't think so. I uh, had a couple more uh, training plan purchases this week. Thank you very much. Uh, those are going well, and uh, people are enjoying them. So feel free to check out our uh, Crushing Iron Triathlon training plans on Training Peaks. Leave us a review, and really looking forward to having some of uh, having some guests on age group guests that we've uh, communicated with, and um, coming up here here soon. I'm really looking forward to having them on and hearing and sharing their story with uh, the masses. Yeah, I'm excited about that too, and. Regarding the training training plans on Training Peaks, there's definitely swim specific one. There's at least one, right? Or yeah, what what I did was I compiled every single swim workout I've ever created. Um, and what I did is, and you'll see this in the uh, in the instructions. Uh, there's kind of a brief a brief dis- uh, description of it, and I I break them down uh, into. Uh, specificity so what i do is i kind of break them down into uh different levels of uh what you want to focus on so you got you got speed i just category i put them in different categories you got speed endurance strength and and race prep and i put them in different blocks and then i go over and kind of tell you how uh, how to structure your week uh when to put these in how close to your race to put these and basically, it's uh, it was a lot easier. I've had a lot of requests to like give people like a workout binder or uh, index cards or whatever to take the pool and do these workouts. But um, putting them in this uh, category gives everyone access to all the workouts uh, I've ever created that prescribed to all my athletes and even to myself, and gives you instruction on how to implement them into your own program. I like it, man. I like the plan. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that wraps up the Crushing Iron podcast on open water swimming. I hope it does. You guys have learned at least a little something, and uh, we'll be back at you soon with some, uh, hopefully, some age groupers and uh, who knows what. Oh, one more thing. Uh, have you started uh, Peak Performance yet? Yes, I have. Yeah, we Mike and I got an advanced copy of uh, Peak Performance, and I have started it. Um, I read the foreword and the introduction, and I am just so jacked to get into this book. It, it sounds yeah. amazing. I'm, I'm super stoked. Yeah, so uh, we will have uh, Brad on at some point, correct? Yep, yeah, yeah probably in uh, either late April or May. So it was co authored by uh, Steve Magnus and Brad Stolberg. Brad Stolberg. And we're going to have Brad on soon, and hopefully, maybe get Steve back, because that was cool too. Yeah, I'd love to have it back on. Okay. Have a great training week, and we will talk to you soon. Yep. Have a good one. See you, bud.